Hello, in this session what we will do is take a look at the many different ways Java EE or Jakarta EE applications can run on the cloud. Uh, in this particular case we'll be using Azure. Um, Azure obviously I believe is particularly well suited for running this type of applications. Uh, but quite honestly you could use uh, any um, major cloud to do similar things uh, more or less. Uh, but obviously in this case we'll be focusing on Azure uh, feel free to obviously take this talk and uh, adapt it um, adapt it in a different way. So uh, our objective is not to uh, do a lecture. My objective is to actually show you how to do all of these things. Uh, and in fact, I, instead of a slide, what I will have is a GitHub uh, uh, repository. So this is the URL of the GitHub repository. Uh, it's uh, essentially one of the most popular repositories uh, on my own personal GitHub account. Should be relatively easy to find. Uh, so what I will do is essentially run demos end-to-end, -end, uh, slideless for the entire session. Uh, there's no slides, but what you do have is step-by-step -step instructions uh, on doing everything that I will be doing today uh, in the next hour or so. Uh, so you should absolutely feel free uh, to run this uh, talk by yourself or and explore this code base uh, through the GitHub instructions by yourself. In fact, these instructions are actually geared towards a uh, one-day uh, lab, hands-on lab. Uh, so uh, we won't be covering all of the material here. That's not really possible in an hour time frame. Uh, but what I definitely uh, will do is show you just enough so that you definitely get a feel for uh, what is going on uh, with Java E on the cloud and Java E on Azure in particular, uh, and give you enough material so that you can take a look at the GitHub account uh, and get going by yourself. So the first place we should start uh, is on-premise, uh, essentially on your own, own physical machine. Uh, and show how all of this stuff runs uh, on-premise, on uh, locally on your laptop first, uh, before we do anything on the cloud. So this is uh, what we'll do throughout is basically use a simple uh, Java EE cloud application. Not very fancy, but it does use uh, quite a bit of Java EE slash Jakarta EE8. So we, we're using JAXR, CJB, CDI, JPA, JSF, and Bean Validation. Full suite of things um, should be definitely enough to give you a flavor of uh, how this type of application would look like on the cloud. Uh, what we will do here is spin up this application uh, locally using our IDE, Eclipse in this case, but you could use any Maven capable IDE. Uh, the application isn't uh, IDE uh, specific, it's just a Maven application. In fact, you could probably run it uh, purely on the command line if you so wish. Uh, we happen to be using Webster Liberty in this case, uh, uh, or rather, sorry, Wildfly in this case, but you could use Webster Liberty, Pyara, or any other uh, Java E8 slash Jakarta E8 compatible runtime. We'll be using Postgres, but again, you can use any uh, basically database that would work with JPA. All right, so I do have all of my setup done here. Um, I, I will cheat a little bit here and there for this talk just to uh, save a, a bit of time. So I do have JDK 8 installed on this machine. I uh, have Eclipse IDE installed. I've installed Docker. Uh, we'll be using Docker a bit more extensively a bit later, but it's also convenient to use Docker even for this uh, on-premise sort of on my laptop demonstration. I'll explain why in a second as we as we uh, go along. I do have this code uh, installed locally on my machine. Uh, I will need that uh, to move forward. So uh, this is basically a database-driven application. You do need a database. Uh, I could have installed the database in, in this case Postgres locally on my own machine. But in fact, there's no real reason to do that. I'll be using Docker uh, and for the Kubernetes portion of this uh, of this demo anyway. So I just want to use Docker uh, for running the database. Uh, that way, I don't really have to install anything specific on my machine. It's very ephemeral. I just start it. Uh, it, it it'll go and download Postgres from uh, Docker Hub, run it, and as soon as I shut down the Docker container, uh, I don't have anything else installed on my machine other than uh, Docker. Uh, and the Postgres instance just sort of goes away. So let's go ahead and start the, the uh, database instance via Docker. Have you, if you haven't seen Docker before, I'll uh, talk you through it just really quickly. So uh, here we go. I'm copying and pasting the, the instructions uh, you know, that I have from my GitHub account again. So you should, again, be able to do this and replicate this yourself. So basically, I'm, I'm doing a Docker run of uh, the Postgres image that exists in Docker Hub. Uh, I'm giving it a, this image a name, uh, and I'm also doing a little bit of uh, file system mapping. Don't need to know about a great detail of that quite yet. I do need to expose a port, so the port I'm exposing via the dash p parameter, as you can see here, is a 5432. Uh, this is because essentially every single uh, Docker 
uh, instance is sort of, uh, you can think of it as behind its own firewall. So you can't really access it. So in order to be able to access it from local host, uh, meaning my own machine from an IDE, I need to expose that port. So that's what I'm doing. I'm exposing port 5432. So let's spin this up and see what happens. Okay. Unable to find the uh, image locally. I, I am on a relatively fast network. So what is going to happen here is that Docker will determine that, hey, I don't have this, uh, I don't have Postgres uh, copy uh, locally. So I need to go and download Postgres, which is it's going to go ahead and, and do. Uh, and then it's going to just uh, start up Postgres right on the fly, as you can see, uh, just started right up. Uh, the database is now up and running and ready to accept connections. Okay. So now let's go over to the IDE. Uh, in the IDE here, I already have uh, the application set up. It's uh, called Java EE Cafe. You'll see in a moment why that is. Uh, there, I'll open up the Palm XML. It's a super simple application. Um, really, it's uh, the way most canonical Java EE applications or Jakarta EE applications should look like. Uh, really just one dependency on the Java EE APIs. In this case, version eight, which I've specified up here. Uh, and that's it. And there's really nothing much more to this application. Um, I do have uh, a bit of setup that I've done. I'll go over that in a second. Uh, after I run, run the simple demo, I'll also show you the code a, a, a little bit as well. So I do have Wildfly 17 <coughs> up and running. I do have it registered uh, on uh, with my IDE here. So I'm going to just uh, run this application. I've done a little bit of setup beforehand. Uh, namely, I've set up the data source uh, for uh, this application to connect up to the running uh, Postgres instance that I have. All right, so let's go ahead and give this a spin. I'm going to right click this application. I'm just going to do a simple build. So run as uh, Maven install. And it should go without a hitch. So there we have it. We have our uh, thin war. Uh, it's a pretty simple uh, and small thin war. Uh, and we're going to run this war file uh, on Wildfly. So I'm going to right click now uh, and say simply run as run on server. And that's going to start up my uh, Wildfly instance and run the application. And it should open up the application in an inbuilt browser uh, in the IDE, as you know. Uh, this is a relatively well understood feature of Eclipse. Okay, so there's my application. It's running on localhost port 8080, which is a default port for Wildfly. Uh, as you can see, I've pre populated the database with a bit of data. Uh, so I have uh, two. Uh, instances of coffees here. Uh, I have uh, Reza 1 and Reza 2. Um, I won't uh, bore you by showing you the uh, entire data, but basically uh, what you can do here is uh, create a new coffee instance uh, as well as delete the coffee instances. So th there's your basic uh, CRUD functionality here. I'll show you a little bit about uh, the application itself. Not too much, just so uh, you get enough confidence that this is in fact a uh, Jakarta EE or Java EE application. So uh, we'll go and take a look at the Java resources. Uh, and what we see here is there is a REST interface. I'll show you the REST interface. Uh, it's a JAXRS based REST interface, as you see. Uh, publish under path coffees. Uh, and then I'm injecting a repository instance in here. Uh, and basically, it's a CRUD uh, interface. So I have get. Uh, for all of the co instances of coffee, I have post to create a new instance of a coffee. Uh, I have a get a particular instance of, of a coffee. Uh, I need that to show some of the details of, of a particular coffee. Uh, and then I have a functionality to delete a coffee instance. Uh, behind here is a uh, entity uh, object that I'm referencing. Pretty simple entity. It's the coffee entity. And it looks like... Uh, Things are just a bit sluggish at the moment. What we'll do here is simply open this up uh, through the resource. It's a bit faster. Okay, so here's the coffee entity. It's a JPA entity. Uh, and we have uh, a generated ID and really just two data points, uh, the name and the price, and that's really it, as you saw from the from the screen itself. 
Uh, there's also a repository behind this. Okay, it's a simple CRUD, uh, CRUD repository. Uh, just in injecting your persistence uh, manager, you could even use Delta Spike data to uh, to further uh, um, abstract this uh, repository if you wanted to. I didn't bother. This is just a stateless session being for me, and I'm injecting an entity manager and doing some simple operations uh, to do uh, essentially add uh, remove of entities and finding the finding the coffee beans themselves. There is a JSF backend to this. I, I won't bother showing you uh, that. The JSF backend, what it is doing is that it is invoking the REST in interfaces behind the scenes, similar to what you would perhaps do uh, using Angular or Vue. Um, so that is it in terms of what I want to show you of the application itself. So let's uh, minimize the ID, but I do want to show you a little bit of the setup that I have done behind the scenes. So this is the application. It's a Maven application, nothing special about that. Under the server directory here, there are a few steps that I have taken, and all of the steps are actually outlined here, so you can uh, replicate them yourself in your local environment. But basically, this is what I've done. Uh, I need a Postgres jar file. I've, I've uh, downloaded and installed that, and uh, put that in the library directory for Wildfly uh, locally here uh, on my machine. Um, the Postgres jar file must be accompanied by a module.xml uh, just to register it with Wildfly. So this is what what it is. It's a relatively boilerplate. Uh, nothing much more going on really here uh, and I do have a custom standalone.xml file and really the only big change that I've done here is that I've specified the uh, the database which is right here as you can see okay so you have given it a JNDI name uh, and given it, given it a name of the pool and basically I'm connecting up to localhost port 5432 uh, uh, and that is uh, working because I've exposed uh, that port uh, under docker and that's really it right there's nothing uh, modules going on here. All right, so that is it in terms of my local installation of uh, of this application and running you and, and showing you how this works in the old-fashioned way. Uh, now let's uh, go and take uh, all of this stuff and run it on the cloud. So the first, uh, there's a couple of di many different ways that we could do this, certainly on Azure. I'll give you uh, a description of what they are and sort of what I will cover next. So the, the simplest way to do this is just use uh, virtual machines. Um, so this is very similar to what you would do perhaps in your own data center, except that you're doing it on Azure instead. Uh, you're literally creating um, an instance of an operating system and doing whatever you need to do uh, in order to get the uh, environment ready for this application and then deploy the application and run it. So that would be IaaS. Uh, on the opposite level of abstraction is PaaS or platform as a service. So in this option, uh, what would happen is you would uh, do very little in terms of environment setup. You really don't care about things like operating systems and so on. You just want, some, want an instance of Wildfly is going to be managed for you by the environment. Uh, and we do have such an uh, option available uh, on Azure. It's a, uh, essentially App Service Linux, Linux Wildfly. Uh, it's a fully managed uh, instance of Wildfly that you don't need to uh, worry about the th kind of things you would worry about for Docker and Kubernetes or IaaS. Uh, everything is relatively abstracted for you. Uh, we can also run uh, this application purely using Docker. Uh, so I'll show you in a moment uh, how you can take this application and Dockerize it, and uh, you can run that Docker image using um, Azure uh, container instances. Right. So this is uh, something a lightweight uh, usage of Docker, if you will, uh, on the cloud. Uh, and of course, above and beyond that, you can go uh, whole scale with containerization and use Kubernetes. Uh, Azure has a very um, good Kubernetes implementation, uh, Azure Kubernetes service. Uh, so you can um, you take full advantage of everything, every single thing in the container ecosystem uh, and deploy this application using Docker and Kubernetes as well. So I won't be, show, be able to show you all of this uh, in an hour time span. Uh, what I'm going to aim to show you is perhaps the simplest uh, option, which is uh, containers and, and uh, IaaS. Uh, if you're new to the cloud, this is how you would typically probably start with uh, to get yourself comfortable. It's very close to how things would be if you were running on premise. And I'll show you the most popular option. Uh, and the most popular option these days uh, really is Kubernetes. So I'll show you the Kubernetes uh, way of deploying this application uh, to uh, to the to the cloud to to uh, Azure as well, uh, and then I'll let you explore uh, the other two options, namely the Azure Container Instances or just plain Docker, uh, or uh, the fully abstracted, fully managed uh, managed Wildfly uh, by yourself as well. 
uh, the idea here is, is very, very similar. So once you uh, especially take a look at the Kubernetes way of running things, um, those two ways will uh, seem more or less pretty natural uh, and not really all that, uh, all, all that mystifying. So let's go ahead and, and start uh, with uh, Azure Linux uh, uh, containers. So this is, again, very similar to what you would be doing uh, if you were doing this uh, sort of by, uh, you know, by yourself on, in, in your own data center, except the data center in this case, obviously, is Azure. So similar to how we started uh, the database, which actually we don't need anymore. So I'm going to just uh, shut down uh, this database. I just hit Control C. Now the database is shut down. Uh, I don't need the instances of a database anymore. And in fact, I'm going to shut down Wildfly as well, just to be just for good measure. So Wildfly is also now shut down. Uh, so just like I had a uh, database uh, instance running uh, running locally, I need a database instance running on the cloud. And there's many different ways you could do that. Uh, but the easiest way is just to use a PaaS. So we do have a Postgres PaaS option uh, on Azure. Uh, and in fact, uh, the, I have the steps outlined uh, here on how you would go about creating that uh, through the Azure portal. Uh, this is not really that fundamental to our the Java E side of the story. So I'm going to skip this over, cheat a little bit, um, just for the sake of time. So I've already created a, a, a DB instance managed version of, uh, of of Postgres here. So it's called Java E Cafe DB slash Reza. If I go in here, you'll see that it is deployed onto Azure already. Uh, this is the Azure portal, if you haven't seen it before. Uh, it is uh, deployed uh, in, in the central US location, uh, and I have a, basically a, a running instance of uh, Postgres that I can access and use, and that's what I'm going to be using um, for the next version of my demo, uh, where I'll be running this application on the cloud instead of running it uh, on my own laptop. Okay, so moving forward, uh, first thing we need to do uh, in order to get this running on, on the cloud using virtual machines is create the virtual machine. Um, how do we do that? Well, uh, that's what I'm going to show you now. So first thing is uh, to go into the Azure portal uh, and create a virtual machine. In this case, we're going to be using Ubuntu. It's a popular uh, Linux distribution. So let's go ahead and, and, uh, and go ahead and create that. Uh, and I'll be flipping back and forth between these instructions and the Azure portal. Uh, you can do all of this, by the way, using uh, something called the Azure CLI or other mechanisms as well. But the Azure portal is uh, sort of a beginner-friendly way uh, of doing a lot of these things. So we're going to go to the Azure portal, uh, and we're going to try to create a resource. Uh, and what we are going to do is you'll see several categories here. Uh, the category that we're interested in in this case is compute. Uh, and that's more or less uh, a synonym for uh, IaaS, or infrastructure as a service. And there's various uh, uh, VMs that I could, VM images that I could use here uh, that I could start with. But the one I'm, I'm going to start with is Ubuntu. Okay, so I'll go ahead and uh, hit Ubuntu here on the portal. I'm presented with several options. Uh, first thing you'll need to do is uh, choose a resource group. This is more or less, you can think of this as a logical data center uh, grouping. So I'm going to, I've created one already. It's called Java E Cafe Group Reza. I'm just going to reuse that one. <coughs> So that's where, uh, for example, my database also resides. Uh, this is just a way of uh, thinking about this entire deployment a bit easier. I do need to give the virtual machine a name. So the name I'm going to choose here is going to be Java EE Cafe Server Reza. Uh, I'll, I'll choose my own suffix for that. So I'm going to just go ahead and copy and paste this uh, from my instruction set. Uh, I need to give a name uh, here of Reza. Okay, so this is this uh, virtual machine is called Java E Cafe Reza. Uh, it happens to be running Ubuntu. Uh, as a region, I'm going to choose Central US. So the same one as uh, where I have uh, my, uh, my Postgres in instance running, just to reduce the latency a little bit. Um, I don't think I need to change. Uh, so I do need to specify a username and password. Uh, you can use SSH to access this machine, and we will be accessing this machine uh, in just a moment using SSH. But I'll, I'll be taking it a little bit easier. I'll be I'll be using passwords instead. So a little bit old-fashioned, but still works uh, just fine. So I'm going to uh, specify Wildfly as the username uh, to access this virtual machine remotely. So here we go. Uh, and I'm going to give it a suitable password. Nothing too complicated. Uh, just something to uh, to get by just for the demo. Uh, so I'm going to just uh, enter the password here and confirm the password here. And I believe that is really all I need to do. Let, oh no, no, there's a few other steps we need to we need to do as well. Um, so by default, uh, again, 
this virtual machine won't be accessible to the outside world. Uh, but we do want this to be accessible from the outside world. One is we need to go ahead and do some setup steps uh, on to this machine. And we also want this uh, uh, application to be available on the internet. So I actually need to allow this virtual machine to be uh, to be accessible from the web. So I need to open up a certain select number of ports. So the ports that I'm going to open up are HTTP, uh, uh, eight, uh, a port 80. Okay, this is where I'll be accessing my web application. I do want HTTPS access, and I do want SSH access as well. In fact, SSH is what I'll be do, I'll be using in order to set up the rest of my application. So I'll choose SSH. So those are the uh, ports that I need open. I don't need RDP uh, uh, just because I won't be using RDP in this case. I'll simply be using SSH instead. Uh, so I, do I need to do anything else here? No, I don't. Uh, so we're basically ready to go, uh, and we're going to get go ahead and uh, do a review and a create. Uh, and get our virtual machine uh, set up. So it's running the validation. It says validation passed. There's no issues with uh, the settings, the default settings that I've created so far. So I'm going to go ahead and create this image. Now this is pretty remarkable. This is uh, I, this never ceases to amaze me. Uh, you know, back in the day when you needed to do this on your own machine, you need to rack and stack a machine or create, uh, do a whole bunch of probably days worth of work be before you can uh, get a machine up and running. Uh, this will just happen in just a few minutes, right? It, it's pretty uh, remarkable what is going on here. Uh, but as this is going on, it's going to take a few minutes for this to deploy. As this is going on, uh, let's take a look at a little bit more greater detail uh, into our application and what we will be doing next. Okay, so this is what we'll be doing next. So as, as you can see, there's not a lot uh, going on that is different. We'll be more or less taking uh, the Java EE application that we had deployed uh, on premise, but we do need to make a small change and that is that our standalone.xml will be a little bit different, right, uh, than uh, what it would have been on premise, uh, obviously because local host doesn't make any sense here. So we need to uh, specify where our, uh, where our application where our database is actually running. Uh, and so that is the difference here, right? So as you can see, uh, I've specified that, uh, that the Postgres instance in this case is running on Azure, right? So this is the Azure URL where uh, I have my managed instance of Postgres running uh, and I have to specify a particular username uh, and a particular password, right? Actually, you'll be able to find all of this information if you uh, looked uh, in my resources tab and uh, looked into the managed database instance, it will tell you what uh, this URL should look like. Uh, there's a specific section uh, that says uh, that, that has this information for you. And it will also tell you what your username and password should be uh, in order to be able to connect uh, to this virtual machine. Okay. So next, we'll be going through uh, several steps beyond this. Uh, so we will be basically doing the installation uh, that we would have done uh, uh, on-premise if we were starting uh, from the operating system layer up uh, on this virtual machine, once this virtual machine is actually allocated. So the first thing I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to SSH into this box uh, using an SSH client, and this is uh, how uh, uh, we'll get the public IP address in a second. We'll actually be able to cut and paste that. So our dip my deployment is complete. Uh, so let's go ahead and actually do the steps uh, as well. Right, so we'll go ahead and connect up to SSH. So as you can see, it'll tell you your deployment has succeeded. So now I have a running instance of uh, a virtual machine that is publicly accessible on Azure. It took just a few minutes to do that. Uh, and the next thing I'm going to do uh, is go ahead and connect up uh, to this uh, to this instance. So you'll notice a little bit of a, uh, there's a prominently visible connect tab here. So I'll click on the connect tab. And it'll tell me how I can access it via SSH, right? So I'm simply going to copy this information from here. So this is the uh, SSH information that I need to use to access this machine. I'm going to go ahead and uh, copy and paste it onto my terminal uh, and hit enter. Uh, this is telling me whether I want to in, uh, accept the certificate. Yes, I do. And I'm going to give it uh, the password that I had specified earlier. Oh, looks like I mistyped that. Okay, so now I'm actually in on that physical machine or running on Azure. 
uh, and now I can set up my application. I can get uh, everything that I need to do <laughs> done in order to get the application up and running. So the first thing I need to do is do a sudo apt update uh, because I want to install JDK 8. Uh, and by default, uh, the Ubuntu image that is there uh, will not have that definition yet. So I simply briefly need to do a uh, apt update. So now uh, Ubuntu knows everything that I need to go and install on this machine. Uh, so first thing I'm going to do is install OpenJDK. Yes. And now OpenJDK will uh, install uh, in just a second. Uh, as I said, I'm on a relatively fast network. This uh, won't take very long. And the machine you're being allocated on Azure is also uh, relatively beefy machines. Uh, it's definitely not uh, not uh, your run of the mill uh, run of the mill sort of uh, machine you would get a few years ago. So this should uh, finish relatively quickly. Okay, so now I have Java. Just to verify, I will say Java-version. And there's a, my OpenJDK version running. Uh, I happen to be running JDK, which is more than sufficient for this application. Next thing I need to do is install Maven. Uh, normally, what you would do uh, here is this step wouldn't be really be necessary because you will be deploying through a CI CD pipeline. But in this case, I want to keep it pretty simple, stupid. So I'm going to actually uh, build the application locally uh, on this box. So in order to do that, I need to install Maven. So I'm going to do that next. And this should be uh, relatively quick as well. Great, Maven is installed. Uh, next, we're going to get uh, JBoss because we need, uh, or rather, Wildfly in this case. Uh, Wildfly is accessible uh, on the web, so I'm just going to do a wget uh, to, inst uh, to get a copy of Wildfly onto this uh, virtual machine. All right, and the zip file should be downloaded. Uh, as you can see, this is a zip file. I need to unzip it, so I'll need to uh, get the unzip utility installed uh, real quick on this machine as well. It's a relatively small utility. I'm gonna unzip uh, Wildfly next. All right, and Wildfly is ready to go. Uh, so now we need to do a bit of setup. Uh, so the first thing we need to do now is actually download the application itself. 
Uh, so in this case, I'll be downloading the source code on, onto this machine and building it there. So I'm going to uh, do another wget. In this case, I'm going to actually download this source code repository. onto this virtual machine. So here we go. All right, it's a small file, really nothing, nothing much more to it. I'm going to unzip uh, the application. It's unzipped. I'm going to next build it. So I need to uh, CD into where this application actually is. Right, which is under Java E Azure Master and under Java EE and under Java EE Cafe. As you can see here, I have a POM, <coughs> POM file here. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, build uh, the application using Maven. And there's my war file. Uh, it's under target. Uh, I think there's no need to really show show you that. I'm going to go back to the home directory uh, and uh, finish the rest of our installation. So we're now, now going to uh, do whatever is necessary to get Wildfly ready to run this application. Uh, the first thing I need to do is install the, uh, the Postgres drivers. Uh, in order to do that, I need to create a, a directory under Wildfly uh, to install the module. So I'm going to do that next. It's mkdir. Uh, and under Wildfly modules, I need to create a Postgres uh, subdirectory. So creating that now. All right, that is done. Next, I need to copy over the, the Postgres uh, drivers, the driver jar file, uh, onto that directory that I just created. So I'm going, going to do that next as well. All right, and I need to in, uh, copy over the module.xml to go along with the jar file. All right, now I'm going to copy over the standalone.xml file. Remember, this is pointing to uh, the managed instance of Postgres running on Azure. And finally, we are going to copy over the var file that we just created locally. Okay, all that is now remains is to start up my application and show you that it is running on the cloud and accessible publicly. Uh, so in order to do that, I need to uh, switch directories into uh, Wildfly, uh, into the bin directory of Wildfly and start up Wildfly. Okay, uh, and what is going to happen here is that we're going to open up port 80. So, so that is the other bit of configuration that is in the standalone.xml file. You know, instead of running on port 8080, we're running on port 80. So I will need to run a super user uh, before I can, I'm able to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and quickly uh, SU as into the super user. Okay, I'm now SU. And now I can uh, start up Wildfly. And you should be uh, seeing that basically what's going to happen here is very similar to what would happen uh, in the end uh, on my local installation that I already had set up. So let's go. Excellent. So now my application is running. Um, so it is now deployed to the uh, to the cloud, and as you can see, it's not terribly different from uh, what you would normally do in perhaps your own on-premise installation. It's super simple to do, but it is running on the cloud. It, it, the application uh, that is now my Java application is running on Azure. So how do I uh, verify that? Uh, well, first thing I need to do is find out the public IP address of where this virtual machine is running. Uh, and then simply access my application. So that's what I'm going to do. And how do I do that? Well, on the same overview tab, you'll see a public IP address. Uh, this is the public IP address where uh, this virtual machine is available. If you wanted to, you could front end this with a load balancer, uh, or even specify your own uh, your own public IP uh, your own public DNS uh, to this as well. 
But regardless, let's copy this over uh, and then open up a, a browser and uh, hit enter here. So here I have Wildfly running. So this is my application um, that I'm just accessing through the browser. It's a public uh, website that is uh, on running on Azure. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and access my application as well. Sorry, typo. And there's my application. I won't bother in uh, installing anything here. Uh, it should be just exactly the same as it is on premise. Uh, for the interest of time, let's skip this over and uh, now move into the Kubernetes portion uh, and sort of show you what the differential is between um, I, running it in the IaaS way, which is sort of the, again the, the bargain basement easy way to get into the cloud, uh, versus a more most popular, probably perhaps the most popular way that we know of uh, these days, which is uh, using uh, container and Kubernetes, and show you how uh, that really looks like in terms of a difference. Okay, very good. Uh, so I'm going to now exit out of uh, this machine. I don't need it anymore. So I'm logged out of uh, that virtual machine back into my uh, back into my uh, regular environment here. Okay, and then we'll sort of effectively starting from scratch uh, and doing the same things over, but this time using uh, using Kubernetes. So again, I'm skipping over the PaaS option. Uh, definitely feel free to take a look at that. It's a very compelling option if you're not that interested in all these infrastructure concerns and just want to focus on coding and deploying um, onto Wildfly. Uh, again, if you like containers but don't really want to deal with Kubernetes, uh, there's a nice way of doing that on Azure as well, called Azure Container Register. Uh, sorry, uh, Azure Container Instances. Feel free to take a look at that. I have instructions for that as well. But right now, we're going to move over our tour. Uh, on to Kubernetes and showing you how all of the stuff works uh, relatively well uh, with AKS and Kubernetes. So you do need a little bit of setup uh, to go here as well. Again, um, I've spe set up, uh, I've specified everything step by step here so you can uh, replicate these steps uh, yourself if you so wish. <coughs> Again, you'll need a managed uh, Postgres instance. Again, uh, I've already done this. Uh, it's already there. So if you look into uh, my resource groups and jump into uh, the resource group that I have set up here. There is uh, uh, effectively my uh, my my database instance sitting sitting right there. By the way, if you scroll a bit down now, you'll be able to see our uh, our virtual machine that we had created earlier. So there is my virtual machine Java e Cafe server. Um, either way, the database is, is up and running for us. We don't have to do this step um, uh, for this. In fact, I've cheated a little bit as well with this, uh, with the setup and creation of the Kubernetes cluster as well. Uh, uh, as you can see, I wanted to show you that in the virtual machine, it does take a few minutes, uh, which we don't necessarily uh, want to utilize here. But basically, what the, what is going on here is we, if you go into my resource group uh, and you go into uh, uh, in, into the resource group settings here, I already have a, a Kubernetes cluster uh, created ahead of time. Is literally just uh, a single step that you need to do that. Uh, here's the uh, fancy instructions to do that. And in fact, it's just one line. If you are using the, the Azure CLI, it's one line to create uh, a Kubernetes cluster. It does take a little bit of time though. Uh, it should take about between five and 10 minutes, which uh, we can, I think, better utilize uh, showing you uh, something else or explaining something else to you. So here's my Kubernetes cluster. Uh, as you can see, there's a Kubernetes version. It's running in, in central US. It does have an API server address. Uh, it is publicly, uh, essentially publicly accessible. Uh, I, I do have a couple of node pools, right? So I have three instance, three nodes running here uh, whereby I can create pods. Um, and there's some other interesting information here as we'll see in a second. In fact, I'll show you uh, right now. If you click on the insights tab, you'll see a little bit more information uh, about what is going on uh, with this Kubernetes cluster. We'll revisit this in a second. This is actually one of the plus points of, of Kubernetes. All right, so basically I've set up the Kubernetes cluster already. I've set up my Kubernetes uh, Kubernetes tooling uh, to uh, show you what I mean. I'll, uh, let me do cube control, and then what I will do is pods, or rather, pardon me, I'll do nodes. Rather, what I meant was get nodes. Okay, 
So if you haven't seen this before, kube control, you can think of it as basically the command line for Kubernetes. Um, so all of the interactions with Kubernetes will take place using this command line tool. It's almost as though you're running uh, Kubernetes locally, but what is really happening is that all of the issues, all of the commands that you're issuing, like the Kubernetes get nodes command that I just issued, this is running against uh, the Azure Kubernetes instance uh, running on the cloud, and it's getting the information uh, from there, and we'll be interacting through kube control there as well. So there's a little bit of a steps here to uh, get kube uh, uh, control connected up to your cloud. Uh, I've outlined what these steps are. They're really not that difficult. Um, so you just need a uh, kube control installed, you need the Azure CLI installed, and you need a single, single command that says, hey, please go uh, and connect my uh, my uh, uh, Azure Kubernetes instance with kube control using this one uh, AKS get, get credentials command. If you haven't seen this before, the AZ stands for uh, basically the Azure uh, Azure command line interface. Okay, the other thing I will need is Docker uh, a Docker Hub account. Um, so in order for this application to land on Kubernetes, it first needs to be in a repository somewhere. Uh, so in, you could use uh, the Azure Container Registry, and the big benefit of using that is that it is private. Uh, nobody else is, taking, uh, is able to see what images that you're using uh, with Docker and Kubernetes. But in this case, I don't really need um, that per se, so I'm just using Docker Hub. So I'll be publishing my, uh, my Docker image onto Docker Hub, uh, and you'll be able to see it there. So at the moment, as you can see, this is my Docker Hub. Uh, account there's really nothing there uh, no repositories whatsoever but there will be uh, something there uh, in in a moment uh, as we well, as we go along but bottom line is i'm using a docker hub uh, instance if you wanted to you could use uh, the azure azure container registry as well so the first step for me here is to uh, build the application uh, and there are some subtle differences uh, between this application and uh, uh, the one uh, that i was using before uh, but I don't need to go through all, all of this. I've basically cheated here, and uh, I've created a war uh, version, uh, uh, a war file already, and copied it over. And I'll show you where that is. So this is under GitHub. Uh, this is my local machine. And if you go into the Kubernetes directory, I already have a war file sitting there, uh, just just waiting for me. I've just pre-built this war file to save time. Uh, and this is the war file I'll be packaging up and uh, packaging up using Docker. Uh, and then deploying onto Kubernetes and deploying onto Azure uh, using Kubernetes. As you can see, it's tiny. It's a 14 kilobyte uh, thin war file. Uh, very, very, uh, very, very typical of how it would look like using a Java EE or a Jakarta EE application. So all of that stuff is essentially done. Uh, so I've, uh, I've set up the standalone.xml file here as well. We will need a specific one, a specific standalone.xml file. I'll show you all of those steps in a second, but there's, there are some artifacts that you will need uh, in order to be able to create your Docker image. Uh, so basically everything that you need to run the application needs to effectively be in the, in the uh, Docker image in one way or the other. So bottom line is uh, I now have uh, my war file created. Uh, I'm going to just uh, go ahead and uh, package up this war file in Docker next. So let's do that. So I'm going to first uh, CD into where I have this code base installed. All right, so there's my directory. Uh, there's a, a war file sitting uh, around in there for me uh, that I've already copied over. Uh, next thing I'm going to do is do a Docker login. Uh, this is to make sure that I'm logged on onto my Docker Hub account locally. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. And yes, uh, I have, I've logged in now, so I can now begin uploading uh, my building my Docker image and then uploading it up to uh, Docker Hub. So that's what we're going to do next. So the next step is to build the Docker image. And I'll show you what, what's going on in, in a second uh, when after we do this. So uh, I'm going to copy and paste this command and I'll describe to you what this command is if you haven't seen uh, sort of Docker before. So I'm doing, I'm building my Docker image. Uh, I'm going to give it a name, Java EE Cafe, and give it a version, which is version one. Uh, and essentially what I'm saying here, the dot stands for look in the correct directory. The, in the current directory, there will be a file called Docker file, dot, uh, Docker file uh, that describes how this Docker image should look like. 
Uh, but I'm also going to give it a uh, name here because ultimately my goal is to publish this image out onto my Docker Hub. So let's uh, go ahead and get started with that. So my Docker image is now built. As as you'll see when I when I show you the Docker file uh, in a second, basically what is happening here is uh, very similar to what what would happen. Uh, if I were to doing this in the in the VM style, uh, except that it's it's a lot shorter and much more repeatable, uh, and you need to do much less typing because effectively anything, everything is set up in Docker and Kubernetes for you. So I'm going I'm downloading uh, uh, Wildfly at the moment, but it's not just Wildfly; it's actually also downloading the operating system as well as the JDK build as well. So that's the first step that uh, that uh, that is taking place in um, building the Docker image. And the rest of the steps are relatively quick. So I will show you what actually happened and what, you, what each of these steps are. So first thing is I'm uh, my base image for this Docker for this Docker image is JBoss uh, Wildfly. Uh, then I am uh, basically going through the same steps uh, that I would I basically did when I was doing uh, the VM instances. So I'm creating a, a directory for to install the uh, to install the the uh, Postgres jar file. I'm installing the Postgres jar file copying over the module file, copying over the standalone.xml file, and then fi finally copying over the war file. So this is effectively uh, describing how my Docker uh, image should look like. How does my, each individual machine uh, in my uh, Kubernetes cluster uh, look like? And this is how, effectively how it looks like. Once this uh, uh, is up and running, it will basically run the, the application as though uh, the same way I was running it in, in a VM uh, environment. So the next step for me uh, is to actually uh, publish. So there's a few more artifacts. There's a Docker file, as you saw. Uh, there is a, a Java e cafe.yaml file that I'll describe in a second. This has to do with Kubernetes. And the module.xml file, you're already familiar with. This is a jar file, and this is a standalone uh, .xml file that is describing the Wildfly configuration. So next, I'm going to push this Docker image onto Docker Hub. Right, so it is in a moment here. You will see that uh, this image will show up on my, on my Docker Hub account. So uh, let the push finish, and the push is finished. In fact, so let me uh, refresh my uh, refresh my repository now. And as you can see, this Docker image is now published onto uh, on, onto my Docker Hub account, and it is ready to go, ready to be used by any Kubernetes instance. In this case, uh, obviously, we're going to use the uh, the one that we just uh, that we just created before. So next step for me is to uh, take this Docker image uh, and create a de physical deployment out of it. So deploy this Docker image onto uh, onto Kubernetes and actually instantiate uh, instantiate copies of Wildfly. Uh, and as you'll see in a moment, what I will do is spin up two instances of Wildfly, not just one instance of Wildfly, using this YAML file. So let me uh, go here and execute this YAML file. Once this uh, uh, file is executed, I will show you what the contents of this file actually looks like. So I will let me go ahead and uh, issue this kube control command. And what we are doing is creating the actual uh, actual Docker image instances on, on Kubernetes. So let's do that. And now it is actually created. Uh, Next thing I need to do is uh, monitor. So uh, I'll show you the contents of the uh, Java EE cafe.yaml file in a second. But in the meanwhile, what I need to do is uh, see uh, if when the service, uh, uh, in particular, the load balancer uh, that is serving the, this application is going to be ready. So it's not going to be ready instantaneously. It's, it is going to take a little bit of time, as you'll see in a second. So I'm going to uh, just copy this paste command, and I'll explain to you what this command is doing. And then we'll go back and actually take a look at uh, the Kubernetes YAML file and, and, and see what exactly went on there. So uh, what I'm doing here is doing getting a service by a name. And you'll see where this Java EE cafe service is defined in a moment. And I'm watching for when this uh, service comes online. Okay. So as you can see, on this line of uh, on values, there is an ex external IP column that is not quite populated yet. It, is say, it says it is pending. 
So that is what we need to wait for uh, for a few moments. It's just going to take a few minutes uh, for this external IP to get propagated. Uh, and while this is happening, uh, let me show you the Kubernetes portion uh, of this application and what the, what the uh, settings for that really looks like. So this is a Kubernetes YAML file. Uh, and, and you can obviously take a look at that yourself uh, on, uh, later on after, after this talk is over. And basically, this is describing uh, how your data center uh, should effectively look like uh, on the cloud. How does your Kubernetes cluster uh, look like? And, uh, so the gist of this is that we are taking a container image uh, that happens to be running uh, my container image here and creating two copies of it, two replicas of it. So there will be two instances of machines running that Docker image with web uh, with uh, Wildfly uh, and all of my uh, Wildfly configuration as well as my WAR file uh, running there and there will be two uh, VMs that are spun up by, by Kubernetes. Uh, so how do you actually load balance between those two? Well, that uh, is also a Kubernetes service and that is the service, in fact, we are waiting for. So uh, the name of that service is Java E Cafe, as you can see, and it is a type of load balancer. So it is actually go going to load balance across these two instance instances of Wildfly that, uh, that Kubernetes is going to create for us. Uh, and what we're also doing is doing a bit of port mapping. So uh, we're porting, uh, we're mapping port 80 to port 8080. So these two instances of Wildfly, I haven't changed their setting on it. If you look at the standalone.xml file, they're running uh, on port 8080. So in order to be able to access it from the web, uh, I need to specify that I want to map it from port 80 to port 8080. So that is the work that the load balancer is going to do for us uh, in a moment, and you'll see that in action. So we do have an external IP now, so I'm going to control C uh, out of this. So I'm going to just copy over this, uh, this public IP address. So this is the IP address of the load balancer uh, on my Kubernetes cluster, so let's access that. And as you can see, here we have uh, another instance of Wildfly uh, up and running, right? And this is, in fact, running our application as well. And there's our application running, this time not in a virtual machine, but rather uh, running on Kubernetes. Uh, let's just add a instance of a coffee here. Okay, so there we have it, one instance, uh, we'll add another one. Okay, so we have two uh, instances of the coffees uh, running here. I'm going to just uh, show you how it looks like uh, in the REST interface. Okay, so there we have it. Uh, that is the uh, REST interface uh, behind the scenes that is that is running this. So. Uh, to go back to the instructions, uh, this is basically the end of the instructions uh, of, for Kubernetes. We basically have your application up and running now. What you can experiment with is uh, Kubernetes can also auto-scale these instances for you. So let's say you wanted uh, three copies of uh, Wildfly running instead of two. So you can easily do that by simply using the scale command uh, in, uh, in Kubernetes to do that. Now, some of the other nice things about Kubernetes is, is uh, uh, a lot of, in, in many of these cases, so first thing you should note is that uh, how simple this was, right? So if you were to do that in the past and you were to set up a Wildfly with a load balancer in front of it, there's a whole bunch of uh, configuration that you would, need, you would have needed to do. All of that configuration essentially goes away. Uh, so all of that is handled by Kubernetes. Uh, uh, the deployment uh, rolling deployments can, are also handled by Kubernetes as opposed to uh, handled by the application server. And um, basic monitoring is also handled by Kubernetes. So if you want go into the uh, Azure uh, monitor in this case, Azure Insights monitor, uh, you will see that Azure Insights monitor will actually show you information about uh, CPU utilization for each node, uh, memory utilization for each node, uh, access, uh, some access acti activity counts, and so on and so forth. So a lot of the information that you would uh, have seen uh, from uh, your uh, application server uh, uh, console is now available uh, inside of the Kubernetes environment instead. And you can take a look at a very in-depth information about uh, about all kinds of things that are that are going on, uh, on in in the container and Kubernetes environment.
So basically what happens here is that uh, a lot of the uh, your your information that you would have done in, in IaaS is all automated. Uh, it's basically all repeatable. You can run the same Docker file locally if you, if you so if you so wanted and you can uh, take the same Docker file and run it on Kubernetes. Uh, uh, you have to deal with the infrastructure a little bit, but not nearly as much as you would in IaaS. Uh, whereas in PaaS, it would be even more abstracted than this would be. You really would have no concerns about uh, things like operating systems and so on. All of those would be would be managed for you. Uh, and a lot of the things that you would have done manually uh, is basically handled by the Kubernetes uh, environment itself. So that is the big differential between uh, Kubernetes and, and why uh, it's somewhat justifiably uh, pretty popular. So I hope uh, you got a flavor for how easy it is uh, uh, to run a Java EE or Jakarta EE application on the cloud. Uh, there's many different ways of doing this. Uh, there's really nothing holding you back whatsoever. I just showed you two different options of just on Azure, uh, and there's many other options on Azure as well. Uh, and all of these are mostly equivalent. Right? If you look at uh, other clouds, they will also have similar uh, features more or less so really uh, all all the power to you if you're a java e and jakarta e user uh, the cloud is uh, is your domain uh, you should be perfectly comfortable and have many different powerful choices uh, on the cloud here i hope this is useful uh, feel free to take take a look at the uh, github url uh, feel free to check out the code uh, hopefully this will be uh, the beginning of a long journey for you on the cloud using java e and jakarta e